All right, welcome to our first chapter that we are going to discuss in class, your first video lecture, and then we're going over chapter two, which is life on land. We're mostly going to be just discussing the abiotic factors which contribute to what is called a biome. A biome is a major division in the terrestrial environment, so we are ignoring the aquatic and oceanic environments at this point, and is distinguished mostly by the dominant plant of that area. So you're going to have uh, a rainforest, tropical rainforest in some of them, or a deciduous forest, the taiga. Those are all looking at different types of plants in uh, you know, the dominant plant in that area. But not always. Some of them are just named like desert, okay, which has its own connotation. These are all associated with specific climates. Um, they are determined by the geographical natural history, okay? And this includes how organisms in a particular area are influenced by things like climate, which we mentioned, soil, some bi biotic factors such as predators, competitors, and then looking at how those things have changed over time and how the evolution of that species has uh, created its specific um, constitution at the, at the point. You can look at natural history if you've gone to DC, which isn't too far away, in the Natural History Museum, which highlights a lot of um, plants and animals uh, throughout the world. So climate, which is one of the major contributors, that contributors of this biome, includes the temperature and rainfall over time within a localized area. So this is how it's different than weather. Weather ch changes from day to day, but a climate is looking at these general patterns across years, months, um, specific seasons, etc. And it's generally predictable, right? So some areas you may have four seasons. Uh, um, some areas you may have uh, just a wet and a dry season. Um, but this is, again, what contributes to the flora and fauna of the area and is generally predictor, predictable. So this figure you have here is um, the major climates of the world. So at the very northern part, you have very polar Arctic conditions, and then you have subarctic desert um, rainforest and so forth. So what contributes to climate? The first of all is the shape of the earth, and the earth is spherical. Um, this is kind of an interesting graphic I found which shows the shape of the earth without the oceans. So you have different, um, the land itself is shaped differently. You have mountains, you have valleys, um, and different areas covered in water. So that's what's not um, featured there is the oceans. And these are, gonna, these are going to affect how the sunlight um, hits and warms the area of the, the terrestrial area. But even if it was completely round and everything on the Earth was smooth, you would still have differences based on the angle at which the sun hits the Earth. Okay, and that's um, displayed very well at the graphic below. So. Um, where the sun hits most directly is at the equator, and there you have the strongest or most powerful input of, um, of heat, of energy. But when you go towards the poles, uh, the same amount of energy is spread over a wider area because of, again, the angle of the Earth. Okay, and so there you're going to get um, more seasonal and less sunlight hitting the earth in those areas and thus it's going to affect the living things there. The second contribu con contribution to climate is the tilt of the earth. So it's tilted 23.5 degrees away from perpendicular and it stays that way as it goes around the earth and that's why different time periods you have different amounts of sunlight. Okay this uh, picture here at the bottom is the sun rising for the first time in an arctic environment after it had been dark you know the sun hadn't come up for uh, the previous month month and a half or so um, so these seasonal variations are going to be very exaggerated at the poles as you get closer and closer to the equator you're going to have no seasonal variation at least in sunlight um, they will always be 12 hours of sunlight and 12 hours of dark 
Um, now, because the sun is un or the sunlight is unevenly uh, spaced across different latitudes upon the Earth, it's going to cause different, um, let's say, warming of the air at different areas. So what happens is it creates these convection cells. Um, the way the convection cells work is at the equator, you have this intense sunlight and it's going to cause air to rise and expand because um, hot air, that's what it does. It rises and it, it, it has less molecules um, in a larger area. So, okay? And then as it rises, it's going to get it's going to cool as it gets further from the earth um, as it cools so when it when it rises it usually has a lot of moisture in it right it has a lot of um, uh, water kept within it um, but as it rises then it cools and as it cools it will start to rain okay you get pre precipitation that way and that's why at the tropics at the equator you have lots of heat and lots of rain um, and you have intense episodes of heat and rain basically okay so after it has lost all of its precipitation it's lost all of its water it then goes to the north and to the south um, and creating two separate kind of waves of air um, and it cools and condenses and then returns to the earth around 30 degrees latitude okay and that cold, cool, dry air then creates um, a very dry zone because it lost all its rain um, at the equator. This is called the convection cell. So as it, um, as the cool air then goes towards the equator, it um, warms up and then it creates this circular convection cell. They occur at three different areas, so it, it, it then happens, it goes through that again, um, and happens again then at 60 degrees and 90 degrees. Um, and it creates then these alternations of heavy precipitation, um, lots of area, lots of rain in the area to very dry areas, and back and forth. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Again, you have these three major convection cells on the earth and that where they cold air condenses and goes back down to the earth you earth you have this very dry area and that's where we find desert bands okay however the earth is not stationary and so these convection cells are not uh, you know neat as this figure to the right here shows um, what we have is the earth is spinning and as it spins then it affects these uh, convection cells and causes different wind patterns and this is called the Coriolis effect so in the northern hemisphere winds are deflected to the right of their um, d direction of travel and in the southern hemisphere they are directed to the left and we'll go a little bit more over this in class and then the winds created these are, are named by where they are coming from. So you have uh, along the equator on the northern hemisphere, you have the northeast trade winds. You can see they're coming from the northeast. And on the other end, they have the southeast trade winds. You have westerlies coming from the west and easterlies coming from the east. Okay. In reality, they aren't quite so neat. You do have some other... Um, factors affecting them, but you can see uh, the Coriolis effect in general when you look at winds across the earth. So one of the things we have to see how the climate is um, is specifically to a biome are these climate diagrams. Um, we put temperature on the left axis y-axis and then precipitation on the right y-axis sorry that should say y and then the months of y the years on the x-axis okay and then one of these each of these dots uh, represents the average temperature or the average uh, precipitation if it's red below it that means that it is above freezing temperatures 
Um, and if precipitation is above temperature, then you have a growing season, and that's where there's blue in between the two different lines. Uh, when, temper when temperature is below the, sorry, when precipitation is below temperature, that's where you have uh, seasonal drought, and that's the dormant season, okay? And so you can see that in this uh, second and third graph, you have where it's yellow in between here. This In this area, you have general drought throughout the whole 12 months, and that's uh, highlighted from Yuma, Arizona, an er uh, area associated with you know desert. Whereas uh, in this other area, you have a dry season, um, and you can see the red shading of the months um, shows the average temperature above freezing in May, June, July, August, September. Then the other um, the other six months you you do not have you have uh, temperature above freezing, so you do not have the drought conditions. All right. So another thing that contributes then to uh, the ecology of an area is the soil. Okay, and this is the composition of living and non-living material above the bedrock on the terrestrial ground. This, of course, affects how nutrients, water, and other electrolytes and other things are <coughs> um, available and then absorbed by plants, and that's going to affect what plants are available. Um, the formation of soil is complex. It um, includes the climate, the type of organisms in the area, uh, the topography, including like the the slant, um, and then the bedrock underneath. We have four different uh, bands or horizons in the soil. The O horizon, the top part, is going to be filled with the most um, recently dying and decaying matter. And then you have the A horizon, which has the clay, silt, sand, and organic material from the O horizon. And that's going to be um, a major contributor of the soil type. Then you have the B horizon, which has clay, humus, and materials transported by water through the A horizon, so as water continues to fall down. And the roots go generally down here because this is where, you know, they're also in the other horizons, but the bottom of the roots are going to be down here because this is kind of the end of where the water um, percolates to. Then you have the sea horizon, which is the weathered parent material. So originally you had some sort of, um, you know, rock, include, you know, and the, maybe it's limestone or some other form, form of sediment um, on which all of these layers have grown over time. What type of soil it is tells us what type of plants can live there and what type of animals then can feed off of those plants. Okay, so then this is the figure from the book showing the different levels, the different um, areas of, of root depth as well. So all of these contribute to different biomes of the world. These are the ones that are highlighted in your book, and we'll go over these in class. Um, some questions you might also bring to class are um, the answers to at least. What biome are, do you currently live in at Southern Virginia? What biomes have you lived in? Um, maybe where you came from before you came here. And then think of an um, exotic location on Earth or where you, wherever your dream vacation might be and look up what biome that might be. And you can look at your book or you can do some research online and find the answers to those. All right, so we'll see you in class and talk about biomes.